Hi everyone, welcome to part 3 of our video lectures on sections 10.1 and 10.2. In the first two videos, we found the terms of a sequence given the formula and also found the formula of a sequence given the terms. In this video, we're going to be exploring the limiting values for a sequence and other of their properties. So let's begin. Now, as we'll find out later, it is often very important to know whether a sequence will be approaching a limited value as n approaches infinities. So, let a sub n be a sequence. Now we say that this sequence will converge and has a limit L written as the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub n is equals to L. Otherwise, if the limit does not exist, we say that the sequence diverges. All right, so let's take a look at, let's take a look at a couple of sequences and determine whether those sequences will converge or diverge. And again, the key idea here is Okay, well, as the n approaches infinity, do you, actually reach, do you actually reach a value? Well, let's see. Beginning with the first example, we want to see if we can find the limit for the sequence given by a sub n is equals to n all over n plus 1. All right, so for this type of problems, all that we need to do here is take the limit as n approaches infinity and see if we actually get a value. So for this one, we're going to have the limit as n approaches infinity for our sequence n over n plus 1 is going to be equals to, well, let's see, what will this one be equal to? Now, at this point, you can go ahead and use the end behavior or L'Hopital's rule to figure out the limit. I don't mind which one you use. In this case, I'll use L'Hopital's rule for a refresher. Now, remember, L'Hopital's rule says that if we have some indeterminate form, which in this case we do, we have infinity over infinity, we can go ahead and take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the denominator and evaluate the limit. So I'm going to have here the limit as n approaches infinity for the derivative of the top with respect to n is just going to be 1 divided by the derivative of the denominator with respect to n, which is also going to be 1. So we're just basically taking the limit of 1 as n approaches infinity, but that is just 1. So there we go. This particular sequence does have a limit value. So this one here is 1. So there we go. Our sequence converges to the value of 1. And that's it. All right, so let's take a look at another example. All right, so for the second sequence, we have a sub n is equals to negative 2 raised to the n. Now, this one here could be trickier, could be easier, depending on how you look at it. Now, the way that I'm going to interpret this problem here is I'm not going to be finding the L'Hopital's rule or anything like that. I know right from the get-go that this particular sequence is not going to have a limit, it will diverge. Now, how do I know that? Well, notice that we're taking a negative 2 raised to some n power. So if we just try the couple of examples with n equals to 1, n equals to 2, n equals to 3, and n equals to 4, if we have negative 2 raised to the first, that's a negative 2, negative 2 raised to the second power, we're going to get a 4, then negative 2 cubed, we're going to get a negative 8, and lastly, a negative 2 to the 4th is going to give us a positive 16. So notice here that you're always alternating signs. And we know that whenever we're finding a limit, we want to be approaching a single value. But as you keep on alternating signs, positive, negative, positive, negative, and so forth, you're never really going to reach a particular number. So for this one, the limit as n approaches infinity for negative 2 raised to the n does not exist. So we know then that the sequence diverges. All right, now what about the next example? We have 1 over 3 raised to the n. Will this one be converging or will this one here be diverging? So let's go ahead and take our limit. Okay, so for this one here, we're going to have the limit as n approaches infinity for 1 third raised to the n. Now this one here, we don't need this extra step, but I'll write it here. This is the same thing as having the limit as n approaches infinity for 1 to the n all over 3 to the n. Okay, now for this one, I want you guys to think about growth rates. Which is getting bigger faster, the 1 to the n or the 3 to the n? Well, as you can see, the 3 to the n is growing much quicker than 1 to the n, because 1 to the n, 1 to the 1 is 1, 
it's so we just have one over something that's getting larger and larger. So because this one grows faster, the limit for one third raised to the n is going to be equal to zero. So this limit does converge, or this, sorry, this sequence converges, because the limiting value is zero. Okay, now what about the next one? Now the next one, I'll let you guys try it, but it's very similar to example B. But, well, I'll just mention the answer. This one, because once more, you have a negative one raised to the n. This one here, it, the limit does not exist, so the, se the sequence diverges. Okay, now, what about this last one? We have a sub n is equal to one plus one over n raised to the n. If we go ahead and take the limit as n approaches infinity, what do we get? Do we actually get a limiting value or do we get no limit and the sequence diverges? Now I'll give you guys a hint. Does this limit look familiar? Well, it should look familiar because we've encountered it before. We encounter this limit when we were learning L'Hopital's rule. Now this one was one of the trickier problems because while well, we needed to use essentially implicit differentiation in order to get the desired result, but we saw here that the limit as in this case x approached infinity for one plus one over x raised to the x was just Euler's number. So going back to our notes, we can confidently say that the sequence converges. Okay, now, what about this last problem where we're given the terms of a sequence, not the general form? All right, so for this one, we actually need to come up with a formula on our own. So let's see what we get. Okay, so for this one, there are no alternating signs, so we, don't, we know that we don't need a factor of negative one. But what else can we tell? Well, I see the numerators. It's a one, a four, a nine, a 16, and a 25. All right, so this one here, doesn't look too bad because it looks like I only have perfect squares. So I'm just going to have an n squared. But what about the denominator here? Mm, the denominator seems a little bit trickier because it doesn't look like you have an arithmetic sequence because if you want to go from 1 to 3, you're adding 2, but then from 3 to, well, then from 3 to 7, you're adding a 4 then from 7 to 15 it looks like you're adding 8 so it looks doesn't look like you're adding by the same amount however I do see a pattern because if you go from 15 to 31 well then you have 16 okay so it looks like you are multiplying by powers of 2 but should we just put in here a 2 to the n well, I don't think this one here is going to work because, again, if we wanted to get, let's say, the third term, then the third term would be 3 squared over 2 to the third. So that's a 9 over 8. But we don't want an 8. We want a 7. Okay, so what can we do? Well, as you might have guessed it, you can simply take away 1 to the 2 to the n. And there we go. If we take away 1, then we do get a 7. If we check it with, let's say, another term, let's say that it, if we want to get the fifth term, well, 5 squared is 25. Now, 2 to the fifth is 32 minus 1 is 31. So it checks out. Okay, so it looks like we have our general term. Now, we still need to know if this one has a limiting value. What will be the limit as n approaches infinity for n squared all over 2 to the n minus 1? Now, for this one, there are different ways to go about it, guys. We can go back to growth rates and see which function is growing faster, the square or the exponential. Now, using growth rates, we know that the exponential is growing much faster than a simple polynomial. So because the denominator is growing faster, you'll know that the limit here is zero. So therefore, the sequence converges. Now let's say that we did not want to use it. We didn't want to solve this one here using growth rates, but what if we still wanted to keep on using L'Hopital's rule? Well, you could have used L'Hopital's rules again, but we need to recall that the formula 
for the derivative of exponential, let's say b to the x, is the ln of b times b to the x. Now, using L'Hopital's rule, we would obtain the following. The limit as n approaches infinity of n squared over 2 to the n minus 1 is the same thing as the limit as n approaches infinity of 2n all over the ln of 2 times 2 to the n. But at this point here, we will need to use L'Hopital's rules again. And that would have given us here a 2 divided by now the ln of two here is a constant, so I'll keep the constant here. Then the derivative of two to the n is another ln of two times two to the n. Oops, and I forgot my limit. And there we go, including it here, the limit as n approaches infinity. And now we get to see here that essentially, now we have a constant divided by something that's arbitrarily large, and we still get the zero. However, knowing growth rates, it was just a lot quicker. And again, we covered growth rates in section 7.6 when we discussed L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so now that we've discussed some of the limiting values, let's discuss some of the properties about sequences. And the properties that I want to discuss here are the following. We say that a sequence, a sub n, has the following properties. a sub n is increasing if a sub n plus one is greater than a sub n for all of n. So in other words, you say that the sequence is increasing if a particular term is larger than the previous term. So for example, the sequence one, two, three is an increasing sequence because, well, each consecutive number is larger than the previous one. Now we say that a sequence is non-decreasing if a sub n plus one is greater than or equals to a sub n. So the equality symbol here is not allowed. So an example of a non-decreasing sequence is 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. So you see, each term is not is greater than or equal to the preceding one. All right, now we say that a sequence is decreasing if a sub n plus one is less than a sub n. So in other words, we're saying here that a sequence is decreasing if the next term is smaller than the previous one. An example of a decreasing sequence here is three, two, one, zero, and so forth. Now we say that a sequence is non-increasing if a sub n plus one is less than or equals to a sub n for all n with the equality allowed. And an example of a non-increasing sequence is zero, then negative one, negative one, negative two, negative two, and so forth. Okay, now, a very important concept here is the concept of a monotonic sequence. So we say that a sequence is monotonic if it is either non-increasing or non-decreasing. So what we're saying here is that a sequence will be monotonic if it moves in one direction. So it can only be either increasing or non-decreasing or non-decreasing. Okay, so with these definitions out of the way, let's take a look at a sequence here and determine if it's going to be decreasing. So we have the sequence here, a sub n equals to one over n squared plus one. Will this sequence be decreasing? All right, so what can we do? All right, so one thing that we can do here is plug in different values for n and figure out a couple of terms to see if we can determine its behavior. Okay, so coming up with the first three terms, we have one half, one fifth, and one tenth. So we get to see here that, okay, it looks like the consecutive terms are getting smaller, so it does look like you're decreasing. However, this is not the approach that I would recommend because, well, what if it at some other point for some other term you start getting higher values or larger values. Well, would you, would you wanna go up all the way to the hundredth term to verify it? Not worth it at all. Lucky for us though, we've encountered this type of problems before, just not in the context of sequences, but instead of functions. So if you were getting a function, how could you tell whether a function was increasing or decreasing? Well, you might remember that if the particular function has a positive derivative, then the function is increasing, but if it has a negative derivative, then the function is decreasing. So that's exactly the approach that I'm gonna take here. However, before we do though, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this sequence and rewrite it here as a function. Because again, we have to be careful here between the distinction of a function and a sequence. Whenever we were dealing with derivatives, we were taking the derivative of a continuous function, since the limit had to exist. So. 
I'm going to go ahead and turn the sequence into a function just to explore the behavior of the function. And then I'm going to extrapolate that to the sequence. So we're going to have here f of x is 1 over x squared plus 1. Then if we want to take the derivative, I don't want to use the quotient rule. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this one as x squared plus 1 raised to the negative 1. And then its derivative is going to be equals to negative 1. Well, let's keep steps. Negative 1 times x squared plus 1. Take away 1, so it's negative 2 times the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So therefore, our derivative is going to be a negative 2x all over x squared plus 1, all raised to the second power. Okay, now will this derivative be positive or negative? Well, going back to the idea of sequences, remember, a sequence was just a function whose input or its domain was a set of all positive integers. So I'm going to say that I can only pick x's that are greater than 0. So if the x's are greater than 0, well then the numerator will always be negative because you're multiplying by a negative here. And the denominator, well the denominator is always going to be positive regardless. So you will always have a negative derivative. So that means here that this one here f prime of x is less than 0 for all x values that are less than, oops, that are greater than 0. So it means that, hey, negative derivative, it's the same thing as decreasing. So we know here then that this function is going to be decreasing for all values of x that are greater than 0, which means that this sequence is decreasing. I'll write it here a sub n is always decreasing. Okay, perfect. So now let's go over one more concept here. And this is the concept of a bounded sequence. So we say that a sequence is bounded above if there is a number m such that a sub n is less than or equals to m for all values of n greater than or equal to 1. All right, so what this is saying here is that a sequence will be bounded above if all the terms in the sequence, the general term here, a sub n, is less than that limiting value. Now we can also say that a sequence is bounded below if there is a number n such that n is less than or equals to a sub n for all n that's greater than or equal to 1. So what this is telling us is then that you will have a sequence that's bounded below if there's a number n, then it's going to be less than all the values in the sequence. Now, if a sequence is bounded above and below, we say that we have a bounded sequence. And here's the thing, a bounded monotonic sequence converges. So we're going to be using that theorem quite a bit later on. All right, so Let's expand on this concept by taking a look at a couple of examples. So let's see, will the sequences below be bounded above or below? All right. So the way that I would recommend working on these problems is by first determining if you're dealing with an increasing sequence or a decreasing sequence. Now we can figure that out by rewriting the sequence as a function and then taking its derivative. So doing that here, we're gonna get f of x equals to 2 plus e to the x, e to the negative x over 3. Although I guess you could use n if you want. It doesn't matter. All right, so taking the derivative, the derivative for this one here, we're going to get an f prime of x is equals to a negative 1 third e to the negative x over 3. Is this one here an increasing function or a decreasing function? Well, if we rewrite this one here as a negative 1 over 3 times e to the x over 3. Remember that exponentials are never negative. These ones are always positive. So you have a negative divided by something that's positive. So this one here is less than 0 for all x. But it doesn't matter if it's for all x. Since we know we're dealing ultimately with a sequence, we're only interested in values of x that are greater than 0. All right, so this one here is if the derivative is negative, again, we say that this one is decreasing for all values of x that are greater than zero. 
and apologies for that. There we go. X greater than zero for all x greater than zero. All right. So we know that we're dealing with a decreasing function. Why does that help us? Well, if we're dealing with a decreasing function, and I'll make a sketch here, then we know that the largest value is going to be happening exactly at our n equals to one. Because remember, remember, we don't care about what's happening before it, since we want to know the, val the behavior for the sequence for values of n greater than or equal to one. All right, so I'll put here the largest value m is going to be essentially the sequ the first term of the sequence. So put here a one, which is two plus e to the negative one over three. Um, whatever we get from that, I'll put on my calculator. I get approximately 2.717. Okay, now what about the lowest value? Well, since we know that it is an increasing function, in order to get the lowest value, we actually need to figure out what is the limiting value. So I'll put here that n should be equals to the limiting value, aka the limit as n approaches infinity. So we still need to evaluate that limit. So let's take a look. What is the limit as n approaches infinity for two plus e raised to the negative n over three? Well, as you can see here, as n goes to infinity, this will go to zero. So therefore, the limit is equals to two. So for this problem then, the limiting value is equals to two. Okay, so this particular sequence is bounded above and bounded below. So the sequence a n equals to two plus e raised to the negative n over three is a bounded sequence. Okay, now let me show you guys graphically what this looks like. All right, so here I have to find the sequence and I want you guys to see what's happening as n gets larger and larger. So letting it run here, okay? So you get to see here that we start off at the highest value and then the sequence starts to decrease. We said that it was a decreasing sequence, but it seems like, yeah, we did have those limiting values. The highest point, the m, was at our n equals to one and then as the sequence as the number of terms went on to infinity, you approach the limiting value of two. So let me just define it here, y equals to two, and there we go. You see here that your sequence is approaching that. And I guess I'll put the other y value equals to, let me see if I can do it like this, you have one, there we go. So this one's here are the bounds for our sequence. So therefore, it was a bounded sequence. Okay, perfect. Now let's take a look at a couple more examples. All right, so let's take a look at two more sequences. The first one being the arctan of pi n. All right, so is this one here an increasing or a decreasing sequence? Well, let's see, I'll rewrite it here as a function. And for this one here, I'll write it as f of n. So f of n is equals to the arctan of pi times n. So taking its derivative, f prime of n is gonna be equals to, now remember the derivative for the arctan is one over one plus u squared, which in this case, it's a pi n squared times the derivative of u, which in this case, if our u was pi n, then u prime was just pi. Okay, now you get to see here that this particular function, it seems like it's always greater than zero. So if the derivative is greater than zero, then this sequence here is also always increasing. Now let me just write it here. This one is for all x values greater than zero, so that means that this one here is increasing. Now, we can also say that this one here is monotonic, or is monotonically increasing, and I also should have mentioned for this one. So this series was also monotonic, or monotonically decreasing. Perfect, perfect. Alrighty, so now that we know its behavior, this one here, it's increasing. So if it's increasing, always increasing, then we can figure out its lower value. So the lower value n is gonna be equals to 
the arctan of pi times n, which the n here is 1, because again, that's where our starting point is. Now I'm not going to figure out, I'm not going to write down the decimals, but the lower value is the arctan of pi, whatever that may be. Now what about the upper value? So the upper value or the upper bound, I should put bound here, m is going to be equals to, all right, now since this one is increasing, well, we want to know, okay, where is it going to be stopping? Is it even stopping? Well, let's see, does it have a limiting value? Well, let's see, what would be the limit as n approaches infinity for the arctan of pi n? Okay, so hopefully now that we've seen the arctan a couple of times, we know what its limit is. The limit as n approaches infinity for the arctan is simply pi over two. So there we go. So it looks like this sequence is bounded below and it's also bounded above. Oops. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Sorry guys, I thought I made a typo here, but no. So this one is also a bounded sequence. Okay. Now, the last problem that I want to go over is the sequence given by sine of pi over 2n. Now this one here, is it going to be increasing or decreasing? Well, you know how the sine function looks like. So you get to see here that the sine function, it doesn't seem like it's going to be an increasing function for all values of x greater than 0. Neither is a decreasing function for all values of x greater than 0. So this particular sequence is not monotonic. Because again, it goes from increasing to decreasing, then from increasing to decreasing again, and it just keeps on going. So this one here is not monotonic. Okay, well, here's the question. Can it still be bounded, though? Well, the thing about the sine function, as you're seeing here in the graph, it is indeed bounded because it cannot go past values of 1, and it cannot go below values of negative 1. I'll write it here. The sine of pi over 2 n is trapped, or it's bounded, between values of negative 1 and 1. So even though it was non-monotonic, it is a bounded sequence. Okay, so this is it for our video lectures on sections 10.1 and 10.2. We'll continue on with 10.3 later on in class. See you guys there. Have a good one.